the next special treat that we have is to hear from somebody who has been described by Time Magazine as a hero for the planet. Dr. Peter Raven uh, is frankly a legend in his own time. And so uh, we have a luminary beyond luminaries. It is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Peter Raven. It seems remarkable that the IPCC was formed in 1988 and that George Bush, President 41, President of the United States, was one of the main people who cooperated in its formation because he wanted an accurate assessment of global warming and that the IPCC, which consists of about 1,200 uh, scientists working together, the best people in the field, work in committees, have the best reviews they can possibly get, and then the reports are signed off on by, uh, by about 100 countries that are signatories to the IPCC, and yet here we are uh, 27 years later with idiots who know absolutely nothing about science saying that that is a conspiracy. I never... Uh, <laughs> I never met any two scientists who would really engage in a conspiracy uh, who wouldn't be fighting with one another. So I doubt very much if the 1,200 who are in there could be engaged in a conspiracy given the nature of science, which apparently is something we have a very hard time in understanding. Um, I want to say how delighted I am that this has been formed by Catherine, that this meeting has been formed at the request of the Swedish Embassy how delighted all of us in St. Louis are that IKEA has opened a store here and with their policies and the policies of Sweden and how much I would congratulate Catherine Werner for her tireless efforts and the mayor, with the mayor's full support in the city of St. Louis to basically get real. Uh, <laughs> It seems uniquely appropriate that Sven Arrhenius, a Swedish Nobel Prize winner in the 1890s, declared that if we kept on increasing the concentration of gases in the atmosphere, that we would inevitably be bringing about a warming of the Earth's basic temperature. Uh, that was in the 1890s. Hello, it's uh, 130 years <laughs> later now. And in fact, it's impossible to imagine any physical principle which would uh, increase the concentration of heat-trapping gases in the atmosphere without warming the uh, climate of the planet concerned. Carl Sagan always used to say or point out that the planets that have a thick atmosphere with many uh, gases in it are much warmer, sometimes like Venus, 2,000 or 3,000 degrees. Those that have no atmosphere are very cold, and hello again, why or how can anybody ever waste any of our time and especially precious opportunities to do something about this? Uh, to set the stage very briefly for uh, what follows, I'll simply point out that the invention of agriculture about uh, 10,000 years ago when it became a normal source of food for people, that the development of agriculture by the human race after 2.3 million years or 2.5 million years of history of human beings on Earth, 10,000 years ago when agriculture was first developed, uh, there were about 1 million people on the entire planet Earth, about 100,000 in Europe. And since then, the progression has been inexorable with uh, towns, uh, vi cities, states founded, and with the development of everything that we hold precious in civilization. World population growth for the past 1,500 years, for the past 500 years, looks like this. And uh, as you can see, this all being from a base of one million people 10,000 years ago, we have a completely unprecedented situation now and one that demands our urgent attention. <laughs> Those who say that population is no problem or, and that we'll, we've solved problems before and that we'll easily be able to solve them now are misleading us in a most serious and damaging way because there's absolutely nothing paralleling the situation that we have now at any point in the past. 
our human domination of the global ecosystem and of the productive uh, elements on which we depend is so absolute that we, abs we must pay attention. Remember that about not 800 million of this 7.3 billion people are malnourished in the sense that their minds and bodies did not develop properly that about 100 million are on the verge of starvation at any one time, and that we're adding 220,000 babies net every day if you want a sobering view of the world for the future. That illustrates why paying attention to global warming as one of the major factors, and I'll talk about that briefly in a minute, as one of the major factors to which we must pay the greatest attention is a matter of good business. It's a matter of extreme urgency if we have any interest at all in preserving the civilization that we all enjoy and that's been developed over the last 10,000 years. It may seem that population is the only problem that's important, but in fact, population is multiplied by consumption and by technology, technologies that seemed very suitable at the start of the Industrial Revolution 200 years ago are now proving to be highly consequential in a negative way for our future. There are three times, there are three people on Earth for every one person who was here when I was born. And that sort of frightens me and means that we really do have a situation that does demand our attention. As a vignette of consumption, this is one week of food for a Western family of four. That's how much they use to support themselves and how much we all aspire to in industrialized countries. And here's one week of food for a family of five in Western Africa. It doesn't take any very great imagination to understand that the impact, that our impact, the impact of people in Western Europe, the United States, and Japan is much greater than the impact of people in Western Africa. And then there's air pollution. Jack Benny used to say, Los Angeles, where you wake up to the coughing of the birds. <laughs> but, of course, David Letterman said, my favorite season of the year in Los Angeles is autumn when the birds change colors and fall out of the trees. <laughs> But it's no joking matter, as people in China are finding out very rapidly, their uh, poisonous atmosphere, which is wrecking their development of industrial and economic centers everywhere, is a serious matter of concern for every single person in China and very difficult to do anything about it. Our emission of greenhouse gases in the United States and Western Europe is much higher per capita than the emission in China, but with 1.3 billion people there, their overall emission has now become the largest in the world. I strongly recommend that you all consult the website footprintnetwork.org, footprintnetwork.org, on which I'll depend for the next couple of images. Footprintnetwork.org, a think tank headed by Mathis Wackernagel, which is in Oakland, California, compares biocapacity, the bioproductive area available to us, uh, with ecological footprint. How much bioproductive area do we demand? And that's very much along the lines of the natural step and earlier excellent uh, uh, development of this sort that, that, that actually was originated in Sweden with the patronage of the King of Sweden around 25 years ago. Ecological footprint is made up of many things which you can see in this image. Uh, there are many ways in which we affect the world and draw on the world. But the summary, the thing that I want to call, to which I want to call your attention is that according to the calculations of uh, the uh, Global Footprint Network, footprintnetwork.org, we were using 70% of all biocapacity worldwide in 1970, and we're now using 156%, which means that with 800 million malnourished people in a population of 7.3 billion growing by 220,000 a day, uh, 
we are using the capacity of one and a half copies of the planet Earth on an ongoing basis. This in turn means that by mid-August of every year, we've exhausted what is available for us and are cutting into the principle, the productive capacity of the world that supports us. Uh, that is uh, awful, especially when you, when you can calculate that if you added 50% more planet Earth, you would be not cutting into the sustainable capacity of the world, but you would still have 800 uh, million malnourished people and 100 million on the verge of starvation. It's simply that you would then be sustainable. Uh, we need 50% more productivity than exists, but even if we had it, we wouldn't be any better off. Footprint, Global Footprint Network in 1961 showed those countries which had greater biocapacity in darker shades of green and those which were drawing from other countries in the world in, uh, in brownish, uh, d deeper shades of brown. Uh, but look where it is in 2005. Uh, now China, India, most of the countries in Western Europe, North Africa, the United States, Mexico, are all drawing in more than they can produce to support their civilization. That means in the United States we depend on countries or Sweden. We depend on, Sweden is still within its capacity, but uh, the United States and many other countries draw in far more than they can produce. So when you read about China buying agricultural land or renting agricultural land all over the world, understand that there are limits to that and that um, Gro Harlem Brundtland's uh, Common Future Report of, 19, of the late 1980s with its uh, sort of now I would say Pollyanna image of all the countries in the world coming up by hard work and, and intelligence and international uh, attention to the same level is something which is physically impossible. This is Keeling's curve of carbon dioxide on Mauna Loa, one of the five volcanoes that make up the island of Hawaii. And as you can see, uh, carbon dioxide has been rising continuously. We focus on carbon dioxide even though it's only one of 16 greenhouse gases and we're always facing the possibility of the emission of great amounts of methane, a much more serious greenhouse gas, for example, by the depletion of the Arctic. Uh, as a result of that rise in greenhouse gases, these are predictions for the future. The United Nations is talking about in COP uh, meeting in Paris in December, holding it under two degrees Celsius by decades from now, but very few scientists who have made these calculations think we can hold it under three degrees Celsius, and many have calculated that at three or four degrees Celsius, the changes in the Earth are absolutely impossible to withstand in terms of their horrible effects, and even at two degrees Celsius, the disruption of agriculture, the, the greater increase of major storms and all the rest becomes impossible. You can hear all the figures in the world, but if you experience global warming yourself, you have a better way of, uh, you have a better appreciation for it, a gripping appreciation for it, and perhaps a moral appreciation, which is what Pope Francis is going for. Uh, because the effects of global warming are met uh, unequally by the poor, many people in industrialized countries feel that we have a moral obligation to attend to them. And both Roman Catholics and evangelical Christians in the United States feel that that itself is a serious problem, that we must attend to global warming because it's not legitimate to affect and penalize the poor worldwide. This is a group of scientists, uh, of which uh, Pat and I were members, and evangelical Christians that went to the Arctic seven years ago to see the effects of global warming firsthand. And on the island of Shishmaref in the Arctic Ocean, we found the uh, uh, permafrost melting in the streets of this community of about 6, peop 600 people, excuse me, dropping one by one off the edge of the cliff. 
glaciers uh, shrinking rapidly, trees dying as a result of the changing climate and the advantage that that gave to their pests, and of course, many severe effects tied to global warming in, in uh, global climate change in, in better or worse demonstrated ways, but as there are more demonstrations, the connection always seems to be clearer. Sea level rise, of course, uh, it's uh, uh, amazing that some political bodies and some of our so-called leaders pretend that there's no effect of global warming when this is simply a map of sea level rise since the 1850, 1880 rather, to the present, and that the red line at the end is by satellite, uh, there is no getting away from sea level rise. And of course, people, again, don't come to grips very well with the idea that uh, if all the ice on land, glaciers and polar ice caps were to melt, sea level would rise about 80 meters which is not acceptable and means that we've got to get on with this, but because of the huge lag effect in this, we've got to get on with it now. We haven't got the opportunity to wait around. We haven't got the opportunity really to wait 10, 20, 30 years, even if we think those are good conclusions from the COP meeting, uh, because uh, the it's upon us now. China has already calculated that 30% of its three coastal Industrial areas will be lost to sea level rise and is taking steps to replace them. Vietnam, one of the few rice exporters in the world, has calculated that about a third of its rice producing land will be submerged, and so it goes. Um, at when the sea level rises, you get maps of the world like this, and uh, they are truly frightening. We have a wonderful world, a biological world, into which we all evolved, and that world supports us in every way. We're completely dependent on it, and we must protect it. Our rapid population growth, our even greater and more rapid desire for increased consumption, and our use of adverse technologies are literally destroying the productive capacity of the world in which we live. Figures don't necessarily convince people fast enough that we need to take action because they seem dull in background and we all have got to get on with our daily activities uh, and therefore we kind of put them aside. Moral commitment, on the other hand, is something much more serious. In 1970 at Earth Day, 20 million people turned out in the United States and there was a worldwide environmental movement 20 million people in 1970 was 10% uh, of the population of the United States, which was then about 200 million. And of course, that convinced politicians very well that there was a serious need to do something about it, without which demonstration they really can do nothing. President Nixon, in the next few years, signed into law the uh, key environmental legislation that governs our activities in the United States, and various people have been trying to destroy it ever since. If we can demonstrate the kind of moral commitment that is needed to get something done and make it clear to our leaders that it's something that we need and we desire, then they will respond. If we don't demonstrate that, they will find other priorities uh, this group, in thinking about the, in, the better and improved functioning of cities and the improved functioning of built structures and all the rest, with Sweden and IKEA right here in St. Louis being leaders in that and our mayor's office deeply committed to the same problem, are set to do something about this. It would be almost... Uh, insane to run a business and not assume that the effects of global warming would be going to affect you in the relatively near future or even that they're not affecting you now. Any business that acts as if it's really not happening or chooses to bury its head in the sand while it gets on with uh, business as usual is almost certainly destined to fail over the next decades. 
it will affect in various ways every single corporate activity in the world and corporations that are intelligent uh, like IKEA and like the ones represented here today will pay attention to it, will adapt to it, and will take steps to mitigate it and also take steps to try to affect our political leadership to deal with it. It's for the reason that we need moral leadership that a number of us uh, in the Pontifical Academy of Sciences encourage the, encourage the Pope and the Vatican to begin providing the kind of moral leadership that Pope Francis, with his unique brand of charisma and conviction, is able to deliver. I hope that all of us in this room will continue to play our part because there is no problem facing the human race that's more serious for us to deal with right now if we want in any way to have civilization as we know it to continue for another 50 years in anything like its present form. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to address you. And uh, congratulations. So we sort of drawing to an end, and, and Claire, I want to come back to Peter's presentation, completely overwhelmed about the challenges in front of us, Peter. So uh, the, the question to you is, as we leave here, what can we as individuals do to begin to take on these challenges? Sort of give us some hope here that uh, we can take action uh, as we leave, both at the individual level and then perhaps at at least the community level. As I tried to indicate in my talk, the problems we're facing are of staggering proportion and very few of us think of them as being as serious as they are. The world seems to be dividing up more into individual segments, and this is no time to do that. In all the history of the world, this is the time for people to come together to appreciate and love one another. St. Louis is one of the most highly segregated cities in the United States, and it's high time that we overcame that through our individual actions. The United States women earn something like 76 cents per dollar for men occupying the same jobs and discrimination against women worldwide and against children worldwide is not only unacceptable morally, it's an extremely stupid way to confront the world that we're rocketing into even if we don't spend any time thinking about it. We can deal with the problems here in St. Louis by taking them head on and by not pushing them into the background. By thinking about the needy people in our own community will not only be doing the kind of thing that's necessary worldwide, but will be setting the platform in our own hearts and souls for being able to attend to it worldwide, to overcome discrimination, to overcome nationalism, to overcome classism and all the other problems that will, if we don't attend to them, bring our civilization to an end sooner than later. We can't survive with this. It's no longer simply a matter of being moral. It's a matter of a necessary attention to the things that divide us, beginning with our own daily lives and to acting on them. I've been deeply impressed with the other speakers and the ways in which they've talked about specific things that can be done. Uh, certainly transportation, cities, food are all extraordinarily important. I hope that people will take away from this uh, commitment to do better in loving one another and in attending to the problems that will determine not only our children and grandchildren's future, but the, our own futures for the rest of our own lives. Thank you. You're here.